everyone. Spike Cohen here. I hope you're doing well, having a great Thursday evening. Uh, welcome to another episode of Culture of Winning, the show where we talk to newly elected and re-elected libertarian elected officials across the country to hear from them what their blueprint is for success and how you and those you care about who are running for office as libertarians across the country can win in your races as well. Uh, if you've watched the last two, we couldn't have had more different uh, guests as our first two guests in terms of their their uh, trajectory for how they won. We have uh, the first one was Kalish Morrow, uh, who won her uh, race for city council in Hanford, California. A very very hard fought race. Every single day, uh, fighting for uh, for every single vote that she got, doing door knocking campaigns, running a very very high octane campaign. And then on our, our second guest was Kate O'Brien, who didn't really try much of anything and wasn't 100% sure how she even won her first race 20 years ago and has been elected easily every single time. Uh, we're pretty sure that she just is magic, and I'm strongly considering that we run her in 2024 for president, and she'll probably win uh, just because it seems like there's nothing she can do uh, wrong when it comes to getting elected. But for the rest of you, for those of us who aren't made of magic, uh, we need to be able to know how we can effectively win races. Um, and a lot of that means finding out from people who have successfully done it. What have their patterns been? What have their uh, strategy been? What was their purpose for doing so? And uh, how can we replicate that across the country hundreds of times all the way up to the White House? Uh, and so with that in mind, I'd like you to welcome our next guest for tonight for this third edition of Culture of Winning. Uh, he is the uh, councilman elect in the uh, Menifee, County, Menifee City Council. Uh, his name is Bob Carwin. Bob, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks so much, Spike. It's fantastic to be on with you. It's really it's awesome. I was it was fun talking with you beforehand. Uh, we both have a similar take on uh, how uh, people at some conventions uh, look like the wacky, inflatable, uh, flailing head, flailing hand man. I, I I liked your thoughts on that. So, um, Bob, uh, before when we get started, uh, I just want to ask you. I, I asked this actually on on my show as well, in addition to culture winning, but. Just out of curiosity, what brought you to libertarianism and to the Libertarian Party? Was it kind of an aha moment or sort of a gradual evolution of time over time? Tell us the tell us the Carwin story. The Carwin story. Well, I, I grew up um, I grew up as a Reagan Republican. Okay. I was enamored by the whole Reagan culture. I actually grew up in Massachusetts. Uh, mm. I don't know what that means in the trajectory of things, but uh, my mother was a, a delegate to the Democratic National Convention when I was in high school, and it it irked her to no end that I was a conservative living in the House. And at the time, I didn't really know anything about um, the giant political spectrum. I knew Democrat and Republican, which most people know, black and white. Red right, and right. Blue. They, were, they weren't even called red and blue at the time. But um, I was really taken by... Uh, I was impressed by the presentation of the Republicans. And over time, as I got a little bit older and got to know a little bit more about it, um, really the turning point for me was when the uh, the conservative Christian movement started to infiltrate the Republican Party and guide policy. And that's where it started to diverge for me. You know, I was always a people person. I like people. I love people of all kinds. And when that became something you weren't allowed to do as a Republican anymore, I said, well, what am I going to do? And I started looking around a little bit more and I said, hey, who are these guys? The Libertarian Party looks pretty good where it has kind of the best of everything. And the more I talk to people, the more people tend to agree with that kind of balance. But it right. didn't exist. So I said, I'm going to jump in both feet and become a member of the Libertarian Party. This was over you know, 20 years ago or so. And um, I've been a member ever since. You know, I, I, I go way back. I was involved in um, the Bob Barr campaign back in 2008 when he mm -hmm. was running, yeah. uh, you know, with uh, against Obama and McCain. There was a time where they tried to ex uh, they excluded him. They, they had a, something going on in Orange County, California, here where there was a candidate forum involving McCain and Obama at a church and they called it a forum instead of a debate so they could exclude anybody else from it if they wanted to as a right. violation of federal election rules. So the the Libertarian Party actually hired me to file a federal injunction. I'm an attorney, uh, filed a federal, federal injunction. So the Friday night before the event at seven o'clock at night, we're in the Santa Ana courthouse in the federal court 
arguing to stop an event involving Obama and McCain. And we got really, really close. But ever since then, I said, there's, there needs to be a grown up in the room. There needs to be a tiebreaker. There needs to be a third party. And uh, libertarianism seems to be the way to go. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, and I said this many times on the trail and will continue to say, it. imagine if Joe Jorgensen had been standing between Donald Trump and Joe Biden during that first debate. I mean, imagine, forget yeah. me being able to be between Trump, uh, Pence and Harris and present actual like, you know, policy responses to answers instead of emotional ones. But just imagine having, as you said, a grown adult in between two people who could barely form a coherent sentence and we're basically basically spending the whole time making fun of each other so no i i agree with you 100 percent. so okay so you started as the alex p keaton of your of your family uh <laughs> almost uh, literally yes I, I mean, I was, exactly that the reagan baby democrat uh, republican with the with the democrat family um by the way anyone who doesn't know the family ties reference uh you've you've we've just dated ourselves but uh so you started as that and then once the whole i guess moral majority strategy of the republican party started alienating conservatives who didn't have a lot of you know bigoted ideas about other people it kind of pushed you out so in a similar again sticking with the reagan concept where reagan said i didn't leave the democratic party the democratic party left me kind of in a similar strain where the small government, you know, fiscal conservative party slowly gave way to the we want government to tell people how to live party, you found yourself, you know, agreeing more and more with the libertarians. Right. And if you look back over time, you know, people talk about the history of, of sports teams where two teams and they'll say over the course of the last 75 years, the record is well, there's been no similarities between this team from 1943 and this team from 2019. Right, 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 Same right. thing with the parties. You know, anybody who I talk to about libertarianism who asks me in depth about the party and they want to find out one of the first things I say to them is you would agree that if John F. Kennedy was alive today and had existed exactly the same ideals, he'd be considered a Republican, right? And almost everybody without hesitation says, well, yes, of course. Yep. Well, there you go. The parties yep. shift and change over time and they're not what they once were. So a lot of the people who are clinging to calling themselves a Republican or a Democrat are frankly not that anymore. And that, that phrase stands exactly true. The party has left them. Their ideals haven't changed, but the parties has. Right, exactly, exactly. And 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 honestly with both of the Republican parties their rhetoric increasingly is just red meat for their base and their actual policies are basically just two groups of people that are that are working for the same same group same cronies that are sponsoring both of them. So it's it, it's more and more just sort of a a theater of opposition between them when the reality is they're both working together to just make our lives harder for the benefit of really incredibly powerful and wealthy people. So Interesting. So that's very interesting how you got here. So then fast forward to, uh, I don't know if it was this year that you decided or last year you decided, but at some point you decided to run for the uh, Menifee County, Menifee City Council. I don't know why I keep saying that. The Menifee City Council. What was it that made you decide to run for that? Was that a, like a snap of the finger thing or had you been thinking about doing that for a while? What, what, what led you to do that? I actually wasn't really intending to run for city council at all. I, I've been a member of the city's planning commission for it'll be six years in, in January, okay. which is an appointed position. And I've been involved in it. And I really liked it. You know, I, I like being involved in the groundwork of policy and seeing where everything comes from when it gets up to the top levels. And I, I had never really intended on running. And then uh, Menifee has districts. So we've got a a city manager form of government, but we also have districts and an at-large mayor. It's a conflict oh, okay, okay. make a whole lot of sense. But um, the you city have a manager is... and a mayor. Yes. Wow. Yeah, and the mayor is elected at large, but has no additional power except for running the meetings. But people think the mayor does because the mayor is elected at large. So what right. we've got is a mayor who has to spend five times as much as any city council person on an election to have exactly the same seat and power when the city manager is in charge of everything. So around here, there's a big there's a larger city called Temecula right. who has a, uh, a system where it's a rotating mayor. The city council selects the mayor and it's a rotating position, right, which right. is how a lot of places do it with a city manager. But mm -hmm. we have four districts and an at-large mayor. Um, our district representatives, council people, are, uh, we have a two-term limit. So our city councilman from the district where I live and work mm -hmm. was termed out. 
this year. And he came to me and because I had been on the planning commission and we'd gotten to know each other and my reputation around town, he asked me to run. It took me a long time to consider it. Uh, it took me a couple of months. I went back and forth a couple of times. And eventually I decided that it would be a good timing and probably be good for the city if someone with my experience ran as opposed to a fringe wacko who was coming in to try to change everything because our city is on a really good trajectory right now. So you actually had the incumbent who I presume is not a libertarian? Not at all. So you had a, is it a Republican? A Republican former fighter pilot. Yeah. So you had a Republican incumbent ask you to run for his or her, for their seat. Yeah. His name was Greg August and he came to me and he asked me to, to run to fill his seat because he thought I would best represent the constituency. And here's the irony of it, that um, our district includes Sun City, California. It's the original Del Webb Sun City community uh, built in 1963, I think it was. So there's a huge chunk. I'd say a good third of the constituency in this district is 55 plus community. Right, right, right. Quite there yet. So to have a Republican incumbent um, endorse me before I had even announced, he said, if this guy runs, I'm endorsing him before I had even announced my candidacy to draw me across uh, was a huge boost of confidence. So first lesson there, when you have developed relationships with people who may not already be libertarian or may not even be remotely libertarian, but you have a good working relationship with them, even if you disagree on quite a few things, that can work its way well in networking and, and in politics to actually like by not, you know, pushing everyone away and by actually having working relationships working relationships with people, that can lead to them going as far as to actually asking you to run for their office and 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 endorsing you or at the very least just supporting you and voting for you, which in these local elections which sometimes aren't as hyper partisan as as national and statewide races could be the difference. You could have a coalition of people voting for you uh, in lieu of having a libertarian voting block. You could have a Republican or a Democrat actually support you in your run uh, all the way up to the point of actually asking you to run for their for their for their position. In this nonpartisan environment, city council is nonpartisan, meaning you right. don't have the letter next to your name. There's right, no right, primary right. for for people who are who don't know any of the candidates or either of the candidates in my particular case, um, one of the things that made a big difference for me as, as feedback I was getting was on my website, I would list my endorsements and in running for this, you don't need the endorsement of, you know, the president of the United States. It's, it's just right. community leaders, people who run the local YMCA or the boys and girls club or people who are realtors in town, but everybody knows them and trust them. And if those people attach their name to yours, it goes a long way yep. and developing those relationships and having those cross boundary, you know, in, in my election, uh, here in Riverside County, California, Jeff Hewitt is a, a supervisor, mm -hmm. yep. uh, libertarian, well-known. He actually endorsed the Republican candidate for mayor in my election, yep. in my race. And but he also endorsed me as a libertarian. So there's a lot of personal uh, endorsement type of relationships you can do mm -hmm. that make a big difference to people who just they don't know. I know that person, but I don't know the candidate. What does that person think? Right. That right, person right. thinks you're a good guy. I think you're a good guy. And the more of those you can bring in, the the further along you'll be. Yeah. And it, the, the biggest thing that we that we I've heard from people that have won their races uh, at the city and county level and, and really just any of these races in general is especially at the local level. The biggest thing people care about are who are you? Do they have they ever even heard of you? Uh, and is there any reason for them to think that uh, that that you are well known in the community, that you are you know engaging the community, that you care about them or their concerns? And most often, more often than not, the way that they what they lean on is, do they recognize you at all? Have they seen you at all in the community? And is there anyone that's willing to vouch for you that they know and and, and are, are that you care about? That all lends itself back to be involved in your community, right? Like be as involved in your community as possible. Know as many people as possible. Don't just show up and be like, hey, I'm running for city council. And everyone looks at you and says, well, who, who are you? So, you know, that that's you can right off the bat just by people already knowing who you are, be very heavily involved in that. So what would you say in your run? Um, what would you say was the most 
um, challenging thing that you faced? Or And it doesn't have to be a single thing, but what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced uh, in your in your campaign? I'm going to skip right over being a libertarian as number one, and we'll get back <laughs> to that in a minute. Um, for us, in, in our community, in the city of Menifee, so we've got, in my district, about 15,000 voters. And I mentioned that about a third, maybe, I, I think it might be higher than that, eight or 9,000 maybe might be 55 plus. In this community, traditionally, it is impossible to win if you don't go door to door. If you don't knock on doors and introduce yep. yourself personally to every person in the community, that's what they look for. There is no local television station up until very recently. We didn't even have a local news source. So it was very, very old school. And in past elections, we've had people lose by 40 or 75 votes. Where door knocking basically. would have been the difference, yeah. And, and the door knocking, whoever knocked on the most doors won. So in this particular race, it was really challenging because with COVID going around, nobody wants strangers walking up to their door and offering their hand out yeah, for a yeah, handshake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, the, and, you wanna, and, and the idea of going up to somebody's house who you don't know with a mask over your face and, <laughs> and trying to be credible is a very scary thing for a lot of folks who are, are in the senior community or, or worried about contact for a lot of reasons so that was one of the biggest hurdles just from a practical campaigning standpoint that we faced that makes sense so now did you still do the door knocking but just had to be more restrictive in how you did it or recognizing that a lot of people aren't going to aren't going to answer the door or you just skipped it all together the modification we came up with was we put together um uh, some wonderful handouts that, you know, that was intended for knocking on the door and handing to folks explaining who we were. But I just went, I would, I got my list of the voters, you know, the registrar of voters or even the Libertarian Party can provide a list of addresses and voters and their party yep, affiliation yep, yep, and all yep, that stuff. Yep. And I went, I would pick a neighborhood for an hour and a half, two hours. And I went door to door and I was just slipping them under doormats. And about every 15 or 20 houses, there'd be somebody working in the garage or they'd just be coming home or somebody thought I was Amazon dropping off a package and they happened to open up the door <laughs> real quick. And in those particular cases, I'd talk to people. I didn't right. I'd tell them what I was doing. I'd say, I'm not selling anything. I'm just running for city council. I'm introducing myself. And more often than not, people would want to talk. Uh, but in, so in those situations, I would get to talk to people, but not to the extent that uh, we normally would. Right. Kind of worked better because I was able to actually get to more houses with my flyers instead of stopping at every door and spending 10 minutes. Oh, uh, yeah. It allowed you to kind of work your way through more bank. quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. So, yeah. So in one way, it's restrictive, but in the other way, because no one actually most people don't expect you to actually spend that time or they'd rather you didn't. It actually allows you to get through it more quickly. I actually took a day off from the presidential and VP campaign to go and do knock on doors uh, it was supposed to be one of my days off where I just didn't go anywhere. And instead, I ended up going to uh, uh, it, it was one of my four days off during the campaign. And I said, hey, I'm going to go do something that day. And so I went to Burnsville, Minnesota and knocked on doors for Chris Claviter, who uh, was running for mayor uh, of uh, Burnsville. And he came so close. It was it was actually he did a really good job. I think he'll win it next time. But we uh, so I helped knock on doors there. And uh, what we did was we had um, these post it notes, but they were already pre printed with all of his stuff. And we would uh, knock on the door or ring the doorbell, put the post it note there, walk back from the door. So if the person opened the door, if they didn't open it, it was there the next time they went out to their door. And if they did open it, we were away from them. And we'd say, hey, we're just knocking on doors, letting them know about Chris Claviter. He's running for office. Uh, he's running for uh, mayor and he wants new blood in the mayor's office. And they go, oh, OK, thank you. And it was very effective when they did their metrics. It turned out that a good uh, amount of their of their um, their support came from people that had been you know touched uh, during the, the, the door knocking campaign. So it's a it's a pretty. It requires a lot of man hours in terms of volunteering support, but in hugely terms of, important. Yeah, it was it was important. Did, and I was going to say, as a follow up, did you did, was that a big um, a big focus of yours, making sure that you had enough of a of a support in terms of volunteers to be able to do this kind of stuff? I, you know, I'm terrible at campaigning. One of the reasons I haven't run for office sooner than this is because I didn't want to campaign. I I don't like it. Right. And I try. It's 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 difficult to run an election campaign while at the same time not really wanting to bother anybody. Because um, I'm one of those people, when somebody knocks on my door, I get irritated for right. any reason. 
Right. Even if I'm expecting somebody when I hear you're a liber- the- cause you're a libertarian and you are- got to mute the TV and get up and step over the dog yeah. gate and get over there and move yeah, the yeah. dog away and do all. And it's irritating to me. And now I have to do the thing that if somebody had done it to me, it would make me upset. Right. Um, so I tried not to bother too many people. I, right. I didn't enlist a lot of volunteers cause I was like, you got kids, you got your own thing going on. Right, I- right, I'll right. handle it. And so it was a lot of extra work for me, but that's kind of the way I run things. And I'm, I, I'm a small government guy, so I run a small campaign. You know, yeah, I want to yeah. involve less people in my problems. That's so that's fair. how I ran it. I did. I One of the things that I did do, it kind of took the place of a lot of volunteers, is I did hire a campaign consultant okay. who was somebody who had uh, consulted on a number of other campaigns in the district before me and was also running for city council in the next town over herself. Okay. And all the things that I didn't know how to do or what to expect or anything like that. She was able to walk me through it as a mentor um, to show me how to, to get things done in an effective manner. And that made a huge difference. I imagine that it would. And you were the second person. So of three, you were the second person that said a big important thing was hiring an actual person to, for, in your case, it was consulting. Uh, and in Kalish Morrow's case, she actually had a manager that was managing the right. campaign. Free big difference is up. the consultant tells you what to do. The manager does it. Right, right. But in both cases, you're finding out what needs to be done. It's just in one case, they're doing it for you. In the other case, they're they're telling you what to do. But but getting a professional who actually has experience with this, that seems to be a common thread. Again, I, I, I Kate O'Brien is an outlier. She just showed up and said, hey, I'm going to run for office. And then she won um, and, and, and didn't even didn't even know it. I, I love that she was my second interview because the, 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 the lesson from that interview was, hey, sometimes you could just win just not even do anything uh so you know hey well, the, 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 the analogy i would give you is is uh physical therapy okay right? so let's say let's say you get you, you get injured and a doctor prescribes you physical therapy okay what do i do to to rehabilitate myself no idea so you go to somebody who's got a degree in physical therapy right, right and they've right. got their team and they uh help you do the stretches and they show you the stretches and the timing and they explain to you what stretches do what things and then a lot of folks, after they go through two, three weeks of physical therapy, say, ah, I got the plan now. I can do this myself at home right, right. Uh, because I don't need special equipment. I just needed special training. And that's what in this particular case it was for me. Like I, I would probably continue to do that in future elections, but it would be less uh, less imperative for me the more experience I got. But coming right out of the gate, first election, having somebody walking sp- uh, side by side with me strategically was just essential. Of course, of course. And like you said, in the future, if you, you know, running for reelection and things like that, you, you, sh- you should know a lot of those things. Now, if you then decided you wanted to run for, you know, a higher level, run for, uh, you know, a statewide office, run for governor, run for a uh, state legislator or something like that, you may want to then get a professional involved or something like that. So what is, if you had to pick, uh, you know, a couple of the, the top two or three biggest lessons that you have learned in this campaign, uh, and in campaigning in general, I mean, maybe something you learned during the, the bar campaign, things that you would want to share with anyone who is thinking of running for office, what, what would those things be? Number one is find out what the bad stuff is they're going to ask you about. Find out what the controversial issue is. And no matter what size uh, of a jurisdiction you've got, there's always something. In my jurisdiction, it was there was a, a there's a tax that was implemented a few years back without getting too detailed with it. The when my city had incorporated, we had planned on a budget of vehicle license fees that was rescinded by governor brown at the time and so the the city before i was involved implemented by ballot a tax that would help pay for certain things that this vehicle license fee uh, was supposed to but was taken okay and somebody had put on the ballot this year a measure to repeal that tax and anytime people hear less tax it was a one percent sales tax one penny for every dollar that went to pay about 30 percent for our police department 30 percent for our fire department big deal and it was a major controversial issue so you have to know that it's coming and be prepared on how you're going to respond to people who are a hundred percent opposed to your position on it for me i was in i was uh, uh, my position was that we need to keep this tax even if you're opposed to taxes right now 
it would have been a terrible time to repeal it. Maybe we'll talk about it later on, but right now it's awful. And to be able to explain to people why that's a valid point, uh, to anticipate the questions, that's really it. You have to study the issues that you know that you know are going to be brought up, so you can anticipate rather than try to come up with it on the spot because you look like you're just making stuff up. So that preparation is absolutely something that people that that people need to do. You need to learn the issues and be prepared not only to talk about your view on it, but have in mind how to prepare with other side. You know, stand-up comedians over time they hear the same heckles over and over and over right, and over again. Right, right, so somebody's right. been a stand-up comedian for 10 years, you're not going to shout anything at them that some dude that, you know, chuckles ha-ha hut in Des Moines hasn't said to him a hundred times. already said a thousand times, so, right. So they're yep. pew, pew, pew. They're armed with, you know, a comeback for it. You need to have that stuff in your arsenal ready to go in a respectful and knowledgeable manner so that way people can go, Oh, even though I disagree with you, I respect the way you present yourself. Right. And you still seem like a, a legitimate human being. Right. Because you're not going to convert everyone, right? Like no. everyone you talk, it's not like you're going to get all, you're, you know, a Saddam Hussein election, 100% of the vote, and you get, you know, carried to power. <laughs> there are going to be people that, even if they give you a good chance, even if they think you're a good guy, even if they like what you have to say, they're going to say, mm, I don't really like your ideas. I disagree with your ideas. And I probably am not going to vote for you as a result. But there might be a chance that someone, who disagrees with your ideas but thinks that you're the the fairest person that they've heard especially you know not for the white house or something like that for like a city council even though in all honesty uh, people in city council their decisions probably affect you more in a day-to-day basis than someone oh, yes. in, in, in the white house but that's not how people think they think oh you know it's city council this person they seem like a good person and you know they had a good answer and i, I didn't necessarily agree but they were agreeable and you know they sounded like they were listening and, and everything else it's those types of things if they walk away with a warm and fuzzy experience even if they didn't agree with everything you said, uh, that's a very, very big part of, of being able to win these types of elections. Yeah, you got to remember, even if you're running unopposed, people can vote against you by not voting. If you are in a district and you're running unopposed and everyone hates your position and hates you, they can just not vote and you get zero votes and don't win. Yeah. So there is there you still need to find a way to connect with people who are on a on a very surface level disagree with what you're saying you still need to connect with people and have that ready to go to be able to conduct a civil conversation yep exactly exactly and i think you said number one were there other ones as well that you wanted to share what was the question again <laughs> well lessons lessons that i yeah, lessons that you would get that was good because yeah. when you asked me i went crap i don't remember my own question now. go ahead <laughs> uh lessons that i learned the other thing is you have to be out there you, uh, you 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 really do have to be out in the community doing things you have to be seen as somebody who's not just dropping in because city council leads to assembly which leads to state senate which leads to this to that right 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 it's 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 something that supersedes party and i learned that in this election that being a libertarian running against a republican in a very very republican district what i learned was people will still look at your track record first if you um if you have a a track record in the community for me you i my kids grew up here i've been living in the community for 18 years now yeah um i volunteered at the high school i've been on the planning commission i coached youth sports i go to the local restaurants I, i i'm a businessman with an office that i started from scratch in the district so these kinds of connections to the community make yep. a huge difference to people. And it is the best way to start the conversation with a potential voter. So being active in a part of the community, you know, saying I'm going to start my activism in the community by running for office is not the way to go. you got to do other stuff first. That's, you know, this is an uncomfortable conversation that I've had with a few people who have come to me and said, you know, I think I should run for office. And I said, that's fantastic. You know, uh, what has your experience been in interacting with the community or, you know, in doing, uh, you know, uh, doing volunteer work or in being, a, you know, a paragon in the business community or whatever it is that made you think you should run? And they'll say, well, you know. I don't haven't really done any of that. I just I, I want to get libertarian ideas out there. And I say there are a lot of great ways to get libertarian ideas out there. If you run for office as a libertarian, knowing that you have no shot of winning and 
possibly no one even hearing of who you are, the only education that they're getting is that when they see that L uh, on the ballot, uh, it means that they're going to lose. Um, or if it's in a nonpartisan race where there isn't a, a, a letter listed, that they're going to look and go, I have no idea who this person is. I'm going to vote for you know this one and this one because th- those are the people I know. Um, they read and- the candidate statement. That's the thing. If you look at the person next to you and they say, well, I volunteered for this, this, and this, and I'm oh, there's part that of too. this yeah, church yeah. and yeah. all this. And then you've got, well, I'm, you know, a, a, Taxation I'm new in the theft. community, but I really want to get to know you folks, so vote for me. So vote it's for me, yeah. Black. Or even just like, Taxation is theft. And it's like, okay, but <laughs> why? Now that would get my vote, but you're already going to get my vote anyway. So that that's not, you're not marketing. And that's the other thing I tell people. If someone knows you're a libertarian, you do not have to market to libertarians. Libertarians already know that you're a libertarian, especially the, the more active they are in libertarianism, the less you need to sell to them. Sell to normies. Sell to normal, everyday human beings who walk around all day long and have never heard our ideas and are a little scared of them when they first hear them because they sound so different than every, everything they've ever heard before and present them a reason why they should vote for you because ideas are great. And beliefs are great, and having a strong ethos and philosophy is a fantastic thing, but most people don't operate that way, or else they'd already probably be with us. Most people Well, that's a oper- huge difference. You just, you just touched on it. You said yep. it, that there's a huge difference between libertarian candidates and major party candidates, and specifically, yep. libertarians aren't going to vote for a Democrat. Libertarians aren't going to vote for a Republican. If there's a libertarian, they're going to vote for the libertarian, yep. but- Republicans and Democrats might cross party lines and vote for the libertarian. So you're not going to need to convert libertarians. You know, right now, if, if they're actually, unless they've come over from an American independent or whatever, but yeah, by yeah. and large, yeah. you have an opportunity to convert disenfranchised people from the major parties. And that's an opportunity. It's really there because they don't realize that they agree. And, and focusing on that, understanding that, Republicans aren't going to convert libertarians, but it, it can work the other way. And there's so much power in that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So these were some great things. You got to be connected in the community. Good to have a professional come in and give you a lay of the land of what you should be doing or if if need be, be able to actually help you with doing it. Um, good to make those those, you know, in-person connections like door knocking and things like that. Uh, but pro- and, and good to make connections in if, if at all possible. And this is a reason I tell a lot of activists. Go to your city council meetings and your county council meetings. If you really want to run for local office, go to these meetings. Present legislation. Present your ideas. Do it in a respectful way. Don't water down your message or anything like that. Be as bold as you want to be. But try to make friends with the people up there. Even if you're going up there saying that I want your salary to be less or I want you to free this person or I, you know, I here's why I think you're not doing a good job. Get a friendly relationship with them because you never know. One of them might say, hey, why don't you run for office? I'd back you. It happened with Bob, so it could absolutely happen with you. So, Bob, now that you have been elected, what are the main goals that you want to achieve while in office? I love that it's a local office because the decisions that we make can actually be implemented. You know, what we're talking about on a, on a major federal level, you've got to go through so many layers and there's ideals and a shifting of ideals. But at city council, you can say, that sidewalk is cracked and I want to get that sidewalk fixed. And there's a direct correlation between the words coming out of your mouth and the actions happening here. Right, right. So, you know, in a forum like this, talking to you about what I want to accomplish, it would be really meta. It'd be super specific. And you're like, Hey, you know, uh, you know where salt Creek goes over Normandy and how there's a link, there's no sidewalk there. I want to get the sidewalk to link between La Ladera and spirit park. So kids on their bikes don't have to ride in the middle of the street. Right. That doesn't mean to you, but it's something that I can actually accomplish yeah. as a city council member. There are um, there's two bridges in town that flood out when it rains because they're not uh, properly maintained. They need to be re-dug underneath so water flow can go through their flood channels. Right. These are things that, that need to get done in our community. And as a city council person, I can get that done. And that's the part that I love as opposed to you know, the, the, as the bigger you get in, in the, the higher the office goes, they call yeah. it higher, but the higher the office goes, the less direct your influence is in the community. And that could be um, disjointing. So that's what I'm looking forward to at city council. There are some very real things that need to get fixed 
that I think the time has come and I can I can lobby to get those things done. That's awesome. And in doing those things, we talk about, you know, running to educate people. How about governing to educate people? How about you're in office and what you just did and what you plan on doing demonstrates two things. Number one, it demonstrates that a lot of things that we often go to the federal government or the state government for, it would actually be much more effectively handled at as local and, and decentralized a level as possible. The other lesson that you're teaching them is that libertarian means good governance. And when they hear, I'm such and such, and I'm running as a libertarian for governor or for president or for Senate or for congressman, they go, oh, libertarian, that's like Bob Carwin. He's great. He was able to get the, That's exactly the, what we the want. sidewalk. We want, exactly. we want people who win and are identified as libertarians to be favorable. If you come across as a, if, if people say libertarian, those, those, those are crackpots. That's bad. And in every party, some are and some are not. And the word that uh, people have used in politics for years that I think libertarians need to embrace is gravitas. We need people with political weight, with with sub substance yep. that you go, I want that person to be in charge. I trust that person. Yep. And what's nice about the local level nonpartisan races is you can do that on a personal level. And they're not saying, I'm voting for you because you're libertarian. I'm voting for you because you're Bob Carwin and have done these things in the community. Right, right. And right. then when you go to the next level, if you if you choose to 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 level up. Yep. Now you carry that weight with you along with the L and you go, oh, libertarians aren't so bad. Look what they've been able to get done. And that's, yep. that's the important thing. You don't run as a libertarian. You run as a candidate. And that's the whole reason I'm a libertarian. That's the whole is point. So people won't just look at the letter and vote. People will listen to the words. People will look at the, the, the history and the achievements and the policy and the gravitas and, and know what a person can accomplish. And then look at the letter to see if that makes any difference. But yep. Looking at the person first and listening to the words first uh, should come before looking at the letter. And they are built, it is building your political, like you said, your gravitas. It's building your political capital. It's building the your personal brand. It's building the brand of your party, which helps everyone else that is under that umbrella of the Libertarian Party. So this is all fantastic stuff. So, Bob, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, before I let you go, I just want to give you a chance to say anything to the to the folks uh, speaking just to, to people that are uh, uh, that are running as candidates and just to the general audience as well. We've got uh, a few hundred people watching right now. So, you know, be sure to tell it what what do you feel like you didn't get a chance to say yet? Bob Carwin, the floor is yours. Well, I've just been handed this message right here that says that a uh, they just pulled a van out of a river in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that uh, apparently there was 40,000 libertarian votes in there. So uh, in, until they certify that, I'm going to continue to call you Mr. Vice President-elect. And uh, <laughs> I in, won until, the election. Until that is sorted out, uh, to me, it's still up in the air a great deal. And I'm hearing that there are vans being pulled out of rivers all across this great nation full of libertarian votes and that's, that's where good. they've been kept the the underwater vote is a really key demographic so until that happens um i'm honored to be on with you mr vice president elect until they say otherwise everyone discounts the sea creature vote and we're gonna get it this year and i'm glad to hear that it's many vans because we need a few of them uh so uh bob thank you so much for coming on uh, I really appreciate uh, pre appreciate your time. And folks, thank you so much for uh, for tuning in to this episode of Culture Winning. Uh, join us uh, next Monday. I should have pulled up who my guest is next. Hold on. Um, next uh, on the 23rd. Uh, yep, on the 23rd, I have uh, Brian Holtz on. He is my next guest on Culture Winning. And again, this was Bob Carwin. Bob, thanks you, thank you again. Thank you again so much for coming on. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it so much. And uh, the work you're doing for the Libertarians, we all appreciate it. Hopefully I can carry the banner for you. Well, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. And uh, folks, thanks again for tuning in. I will see you next Monday. I'm Spike Cohen, and you are the power.